Hello, and welcome back to Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. This week, we welcome Dr. Rosanne De Stefano from the Center for Astrophysics to the show, talking about her work finding the first planet yet seen in another galaxy. Pretty cool, huh? We're also going to look in on the alien Hubble Space Telescope as that famed instrument unexpectedly shuts down. We're going to examine the first signs of water within a galaxy in the ancient cosmos. And we'll look up into the night sky as Uranus offers amateur astronomers a prime chance to view that world. The Hubble Space Telescope unexpectedly shut down on the 25th of October, sending all scientific instruments on board the craft into safe mode. The reason for this failure is still not known, but a loss of timing data in the instrument was reported by Hubble two days before on the 23rd. Since systems were rebooted following that error, but engineers are still seeking to diagnose and repair Hubble following the shutdown, which has continued since the 25th. The SPT 0311 58 pair of colliding galaxies is revealed in a new study to be rich in water the most distant and oldest water ever seen. This ancient galactic duo are seen 12.88 billion light years from Earth as they were just 780 million years after the Big Bang. Now, water is essential to life as we know it and it is the third most abundant molecule in the cosmos following molecular hydrogen and carbon monoxide. This finding marks the most distant detection of water yet seen in a regular star-forming galaxy. The planet Uranus is now near its brightest point, making finding this world easier than normal for amateur astronomers. This planet is now right at the edge of naked eye visibility, so it might be spotted without equipment from exceptionally dark skies by people with outstanding eyesight. That's not me. Using binoculars or a telescope, however, makes finding Uranus much easier. In order to find Uranus, look to the southeast sky for the fuzzy patch of light which is the Pleiades, or the Seven Sisters. Next, look to the right about 30 degrees to find the red star Menkar. Above that is an orange star called Hamal. Uranus can be found about halfway between Benkar and Hamal, and a little bit to the left. Binoculars or a telescope will reveal Uranus as a bright blue disk set against the black sky. So, clear skies and happy viewing to all! Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth. And we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. Next up, we talk with Roseanne De Stefano about her work finding the first planet yet seen in another galaxy.
This week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we're happy to welcome Dr. Roseanne De Stefano. She is a senior astrophysicist at Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, and she may have helped find the first planet ever seen in another galaxy. Welcome to the show, Roseanne. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. All right. So can you just tell us a little bit about M51 ULS 1B? What do we know about it? What do we not know about it? Simple question to start off the day. Okay, well, that's a big question. Um, We discovered the uh, presence of this candidate planet because it passed in front of an X-ray source. Now, this X-ray source is part of a uh, what we call a high-mass X-ray binary. Uh, so the X-ray source itself is associated with either a black hole or neutron star. We don't yet know which. And the reason it's emitting an X-ray is because there's a companion star. It's binary companion uh, from which material is being ripped and the material travels toward the compact object, and as it does so, it accelerates, it becomes very hot, and eventually you get emission in x-rays. So that x-ray source is the key to our being able to find the planet. Uh, The x-ray source is relatively small. It is itself planet-sized, although it's emitting huge amount of energy, a million times more energy in x-rays than the sun does at all wavelengths. So we noticed, in fact, we were searching to see if there was going to be a dip in the x-ray emission. And this dip was the characteristic dip of a transit. And of course, we had to do a very careful analysis to make sure that uh, it really is fully consistent with being a transit we were able to determine the size of the candidate planet. Uh, It could be as small as uh, two Earth radii, or it could be larger than Jupiter, but the most likely radius is around that of Saturn. So from the transit, we have a radius. We also have a speed, and the speed tells us that this object is in a wide orbit. In our, in our solar system, it might be comparable to the orbit of Neptune. So those are the things that we, we know about this object. Wow, that's so amazing. So, you know, I don't know if you've noticed this yet, but there's a lot of stuff out there in the night sky. <laughs> there's, you know, hundreds yeah, of there's... billions of galaxies, hundreds, you know, maybe hundreds of billions of stars in each galaxy on average. What attracted you to this one particular target? Well, the thing that attracted us to this type of research was that uh, we had noticed, and this is in a paper by Nia Amara and myself from 2018, we had noticed that because X-ray sources in binaries are often quite small, that a planetary transit could, in principle, create a total eclipse or a near total eclipse. So this is pretty amazing because if you are familiar with transit searches at optical wavelengths, for example, you have a small planet going in front of what is generally a much larger star. And the dip is rather uh, small. And this is why We have space missions like Kepler and TESS that are able to do such wonderful jobs because they have fantastic ability to measure the amount of light coming in and to be sensitive to small dips. So what impressed us is that in an X-ray binary, you could essentially get a, a full eclipse. And... So even though you wouldn't think that X-ray binaries being as as bright as they are and as variable as they are would be easy places to find planets, what we found is that the uh, size of the X-ray source provides a key. So we finished that. That was a theoretical piece of work. And uh, the following summer, I had some students visiting. And 
uh, there was this effect and there were a few other effects that I thought might be interesting in the short term x-ray light curves of a large number of systems. Now, by light curve, what we mean is simply a plot of the intensity versus time. So, uh, you know, you have a large number if you're getting a lot of photons, a lot of counts in your X-ray detector, and it goes down to zero when you're not getting any counts, right? Um, so, together with two students uh, and with um, a, another colleague, we actually started looking at x-ray light curves. And to find the most x-ray light curves all together in one place where you can still resolve the x-ray sources, it's a good thing to look at other galaxies. Because, uh, you know, the, if you take a look at the Chandra X-ray Telescope and you look at its field of view, when it looks at a galaxy like M51, it will encompass dozens of point x-ray sources most of which are X-ray binaries. And we happened to have a colleague, uh, Ryan Orquart, who had analyzed X-ray data from uh, a number of different galaxies. And he was willing to share that data with us so that you know processed in the way he had processed it so that we could do this search in a very convenient manner. That's fabulous. So, of course, this is... This is, of course, going to go out on the internet, so there's going to be an endless stream of people saying, well, this is just blah. <laughs> <laughs> blah. <laughs> it's like radio not. next door, kids. So how did you... <laughs> so, how, <laughs> so how did you... So there's an endless stream of possibilities of, you know, what may have made this... Um, X-ray source seem to blink out. How, how did? How did? What were your thoughts well, as you went through a, that? How did you eliminate them? Well, you know, I, honestly, uh, we were pretty skeptical ourselves, and um, you may know that the second author on the paper is Julia Bernson, who started this research when she was in high school, um, and I have to say, I was very doubtful at first because it turned out that there is another explanation uh, for many X-ray dips. And our colleague and friend Ryan had already published this dip, and he thought it was probably something else, uh, which is, you know, good reason to assume that you're not finding something new. And there were some other things. Uh, this was a longer dip than Nia and I had predicted. And if you compute the probability of seeing it, it was very small. So we actually uh, had this on a very, not only on the back burner, but, you know, really far back, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, Julia, who uh, was then about to apply to college, uh, through the months after we found this dip, and I considered simply that we had proved that we could find dips, right? But months after we found it, she was so interested in this dip, and she kept uh, bringing it up in our Zoom. She kept, kept having Zoom conversations with me and kept bringing them up. And and it, it, some, this, this continual interest, which also drew Ryan in, uh, made us think about it a little bit more. And uh, Ryan identified then, both in Chandra and in XMM-Newton data, the fact that this is an eclipsing source. Right. And uh, as you know, uh, sometimes when you have things that are in uh, orbit around the same object, uh, the orbits tend to be aligned. They might not be in X-ray binaries. There are good reasons to think they might not always be aligned. But somehow... <clears throat> Having thought about this over months and having this extra bit of information that would have meant that perhaps the probability argument wasn't as strong as I had thought made us decide that we would focus on this. So it was really months afterward, and it was partly because Ryan himself uh, mentioned that the dip was unusual for normal X-ray dips, and so... If he had had a planet model, he would have tried it out. 
and his thesis supervisor, uh, Roberto Soria, who is a good friend and really a wonderful X-ray astronomer, uh, really gave his go-ahead on this. He, he said as well that uh, the reason that this was considered to be a dip of the type I can tell you about in a moment is that um, there didn't seem to be another possibility. So they, when they both enthusiastically signed on to the project, and when we had that information about the eclipse, we decided then to really put this on a front burner and take it very seriously. Um, but, you know, you've hit something important, which is that the most important consideration, uh, well, there were two. One is to establish that all of the data are consistent with the transit model. But the second part of it is to look at all of the other known possibilities and to make sure that they're not better at explaining the data than the planet model. So if you'd like me to say more about that, I, I certainly can do so. But basically, that was an extremely important part of the research. There were a lot of potential showstoppers, and none of them ended up being real showstoppers. Wow. Um, and yes, I would definitely like you to, you know, detail if you can a little more, you know, how this model, you know, what this model was able to tell you and how it might resemble or be different than transiting exoplanets that we might more typically see. Right. Well, you know, we, we can't do a, a direct comparison with um, other with, with planets in our galaxy other than the size, which uh, is fairly uh well constrained by the data. Um, but what I can say is that you wonder, did something else cause that dip? So uh, a very common thing in X-ray binaries is that there are clouds of gas and dust or blobs maybe on the accretion disk around the compact object that could obscure the X-ray source for some time. Uh, now, the key to determining if that's what it is, is the spectrum. Because if you have gas and dust, it's not uh, as compact or, or doesn't have as sharp a surface as a planet. Even if a planet has an atmosphere, it's still pretty well contained. Uh, whereas gas and dust, uh, that's a cloud within the X-ray source, has always some diffuse uh, portion. Uh, and as that portion passes in front of the X-ray source, X-rays interact with it and they get absorbed and they change the spectrum. And so we could look for spectral changes. And we found that there were many dips, even in this source, that did exhibit spectral changes, but that the one that we identified as the transit did not. The other thing, of course, was that uh, traditional dips that people have been studying since the 1980s, these traditional dips uh, uh, wouldn't necessarily fool you into thinking that they were transits on the basis of their shape, at least not in the kinds of high-mass X-ray binaries that people like Ryan and Roberto have studied in other galaxies. So we had this rather distinctive shape, but most important, we saw that the spectrum did not change as you entered and left the uh, portion of the light curve that dipped. And there's not any obvious gas slash dust model that would be consistent with that. So that, that was why we thought, you know, we're not looking at a standard accretion related dip that this really does appear to be the passage of a solid body. So now you're in a position where you have to ask yourself, well, could there be other solid bodies in addition to or instead of a planet? Uh, well, if you've seen the paper, you know there's a probability distribution of the size. And there are two things that fit across that whole probability distribution. One of them is a white dwarf. So you might say, oh, white dwarf, right? 
But there are two reasons why we uh, think it, it's actually impossible for it to be a white dwarf. One is that this system is very young. It's younger than the age at which white dwarfs form. And it's in a young cluster in a spiral arm of the galaxy. So we don't expect there to be white dwarfs there. Um, but an even stronger argument is based on pure physics, which is from our fit of the light curve, we have the distance of the transiting object from the X-ray source. And we also know what typical masses of white dwarfs are. So um, if we actually considered that a white dwarf passed the X-ray source from that distance, what would happen is that the white dwarf is dense enough to act as a gravitational lens. And rather than seeing a dipping in the amount of light we get, we would see an enhancement. Mm -hmm. So that rules out the white dwarf. So now you say there's one thing that fits across all of the radii, and that's a planet. It could be a rocky planet. It could be a gaseous planet. We don't know. Um, but there are other possibilities at the low probability end of the distribution. Uh, it could be uh, at that uh, end there's a small probability it could be a brown dwarf or uh, maybe even a very small low mass star. Uh, so there we have, in addition to the fact that, you know, th these only fit at a small part of the probability distribution, um, because the system is young and these objects are born with larger radii than their equilibrium radii, they're often a little bit larger than they would be if you see them later in their lifetime. So, um, you know, we give examples in the paper of planets and brown dwarfs and, you know, what happens to M dwarfs at this age. It all indicates it would push towards slightly higher values of the radius. So because this is a low probability part of the distribution and because we think there's a lower probability, which we can't quantify, uh, that these objects would be as small at this age. Uh, that certainly is not the preferred model. It's fabulous. So can you, is this, this technique to me just seems remarkable. Mm -hmm. Used to look at these at, at X-ray binaries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, are, are there other targets, are there X-ray binary targets out there that you might be able to use the same technique for them? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, first of all, you know, we are even still looking at some of the data we've already looked at because we knew that um, to publish a first paper, you want that to be an unimpeccable example right? This, this is the same kind of thing that microlensing people faced when they were looking for microlensing events, the first ever microlensing events. They wanted to be very sure that they, that they were adhering to very strict guidelines so that they would be finding something that could be generally agreed to be uh, an event. Well, here too, we needed something that was, you know, absolutely without doubt, uh, a transit, right? And then, of course, what what the transiting object is is something that we had to also consider very carefully. So, uh, you know, one might see other examples that are perhaps less convincing. I, I still think we're too early to be thinking about those as uh, discoveries. So the first step is to examine more X-ray data and Chandra and XMM Newton have archives that have several times as much data as we have analyzed, just in other galaxies. Uh, and the other thing that's very important to pay attention to is that this would work for any X-ray binary. So it also works in our own galaxy. Um, you know, in our galaxy, though, right. it may be that you know you you're in your field of view, you just have that one source. So you know, there's a lot more work involved in studying hundreds of sources than we had to do to study 
all of the sources in a small number of galaxies. Wow, this is so fascinating. So finally, what's next for you? What, what are you, you going to continue your work? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, of course, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very lucky because as a theorist, I do get to work on a range of things, even at the same time. But I, I think this is so important and interesting that we, we want to follow it up. And there are two ways. Uh, one is to go through more of that data that you mentioned. Yes, we, we do want to look for other examples. And I encourage our colleagues to, to do the same. I wouldn't be at all surprised if some X-ray astronomers have already seen good candidates. But just as uh, Roberto and Ryan did, they, you know, thought they had a good explanation. And maybe if they went back, they would find that it's a candidate for this model. But we are going to systematically look. We've developed software and we're, you know, trying always to make it better to look for new systems. And we also are working on the theoretical front to try to understand the circumstances under which the orbits of planets can be stable, how the orbits change in time as the X-ray binary changes, and what the ultimate fate of these planets will be. So, so interesting. It was great having you on the show, Roseanne. It was fabulous talking with you. Well, thank you. It's really a pleasure to be asked to participate. Great. And that was uh, Dr. Roseanne De Stefano, Senior Astrophysicist at Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Visit with us each week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion as we bring the cosmos down to Earth and scientists directly in, into your homes with fun, informative interviews. Next week, we're going to take a week off as I celebrate my birthday. Jazzy! We will be back on the 23rd of November with an asteroid roundup looking at the five major missions to asteroids happening now, furthering science and protecting Earth. So make sure to join us then. Subscribe to our VIP newsletter to see every episode of this show one day early. Together with advanced views of our comics, jokes, and oh, just a whole lot more. We depend on support from viewers just like you. For ways to help support this program, including VIP subscriptions, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net forward slash support. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and keep your wonder alive. If you enjoyed this episode of Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, please download and share the episode on YouTube, Facebook video, or your favorite podcast provider. Well, we're not fussy. Remember, you can watch every episode of the show at thecosmiccompanion.tv. For more details on space and astronomy news, please visit thecosmiccompanion.com or thecosmiccompanion.net.